Well, greetings out there in YouTube land and welcome to today's big video, which features this probably late 30s, early 40s Oahu amp in absolutely spectacular original condition. Um, you know, I, I normally deal with big fender amps and things of that sort, but every once in a while, a really nice early amp like this uh, is just a fabulous little change of pace. And I hope you agree. With it came a set of tubes, and one of the tubes is not the same tube as what the tube socket indicates. So we're going to have to check on that. Also, uh, there are some rather unusual tubes, which we can discuss in detail. Also, the owner somehow acquired a rayon-covered, real early style, three-wire cord. I didn't know such things were even available but he sent this and I think it's going to be a great addition to the amp because what we have here is probably an add-on uh, heavy black two-prong cord that's been on the amp since God knows when. He also sent me some uh, tasty little kitty treats which I know are going to go over well and which I promise I will share with the cats and a uh, always an interesting addition here a debit card uh, to cover parts and uh, return shipping and other incidentals um, uh, here is the letter explaining that uh, he bought this amp years ago and Andy reveals in the letter that this little jewel has been sitting in a closet for 42 years which I think uh, helps to explain the phenomenal condition. We'll go over it every square inch uh, in just a few moments. Okay, uh, he just wants it to be brought up to modern reliable specs. Um, okay, and um, I will try to preserve the originality as much as I can, but we are going to have to put in some new parts, of course, and make it a good um, sounding and um, reliable amplifier. It's from Big Dave who's been a long time um, contributor uh, to our channel, supporter, viewer, and has actually sent us a couple amps for us to feature in videos. So thanks so much for uh, thinking of us again Big Dave. Also for those sharp-eyed long-term viewers you see that I've added to my arsenal of Cool Whip containers I have some yogurt and I also have uh, what I can't believe it's not a heart attack or whatever uh, margarine there so as you can see I have broadened my horizons well, let's get started on the star of the show here the fabulous Oahu and uh, let's take a look here at the Tolex material it's very thin but it has a printed pattern now I found out the hard way on one uh, that had a similar material on it uh, and I sprayed on a rather stout cleaner like 409 and it actually will take the printed uh, pattern off of it so you have to be really careful I'm thinking just a damp cloth is about all you should use uh, on material like this we have a beautiful original mustache handle probably the nicest original one I've ever laid eyes on Okay, normally they're all torn to pieces. Uh, the the uh, leather gets all dried out and then people pick them up and swing them around their heads and stuff like that and uh, really stress out the uh, connection here. Now there's a wire that goes through with two, there's beads, wooden beads underneath. And I've seen these get down to where there's just the wire holding the uh, amplifier. I don't lift them by the mustache handle uh, and I su uh, suggest that if you have one you don't either so we'll be real careful with this jewel you see that the uh, retention loops here are still riveted in place and that the nickel plating is still in pretty darn good shape okay let's uh, take a look at the fretwork on the grill I've laid the amp on its back so we can get a really good well lit view of it and it's perfect you know this stuff delaminates and just falls apart uh, it's actually rather flimsy but look at how they sort of shadow painted it uh, on the areas that do not spell Oahu they darkened it so that the Oahu would really stand out got some really interesting uh, little embellished 
screw heads here, kind of a rosette pattern. And the grill cloth, I've seen this in Philco radios, is absolutely astounding. Uh, I mean, I can hardly believe this is original grill cloth. Probably is, because I don't think anybody snuck into the closet during that 42 years and, and sort of secretly install new grill cloth. But look at that. It's beautiful. The base is as nice as the rest of it, which is unusual because these will be stored in a damp place and the moisture will just destroy uh, the Tolex on the bottom. Four nice original rubber feet. Uh, they got the corner protectors only on the bottom okay which is pretty much the way they used to be done and uh, we see here the four screws that we will have to remove so that we can get the uh, chassis and circuit out of the rear of the amp now let's take a look at the, the chassis itself all right I've tilted the cabinet uh, so we can get some proper lighting here we see that it has an electrodynamic speaker it is a C8RS uh, 8 inch Jensen Series RS, which I think would stand for the Electrodynamic uh, Series of Speakers. And uh, there is the part number. Uh, let's try to find a date stamp on this uh, somewhere on the perimeter of the basket. Well, try as I might, I can't find any sort of uh, printed date stamp with my luck it's lurking there behind the output transformer uh, I don't see one but I can see the cone and it looks like it's going to be in absolutely perfect shape okay so there's the output transformer here's the power transformer and in uh, early tube amp uh, style they've labeled the sockets 65 65 6 and 6 and an 80. I'm thinking most of you um, have never heard of or seen any of these tubes. So let's go ahead and uh, discuss them in detail. Uh, the 80 is the rectifier um, and see exactly how they're structured and uh, how they're going to work in the circuit. Before we do that, let's take a look at the rest of the very elaborate controls Okay, we've got two different inputs. I'm assuming that one might have a little bit different impedance. My guess is one of these is going to have a capacitor blocking uh, the DC on the input. And the other probably won't. Just a wild guess. But uh, remember in the uh, old days, these were used with like lap steel guitars and sometimes with uh, devices that had their own power supply. And if you had the DC coming in to the input jack and going to the grid of your first preamp tube, it's going to uh, play havoc with the biasing of the tube. So we'll see when we get in there. Okay, it's just a guess. Uh, here's going to be our on-off and our volume control with a nice red chicken head knob. We have our indicator light and screw and fuse holder. And then a really old-fashioned... Royal Electric Company power cord that may or may not be original. I will return it to the owner with the amp just in case it is original, but uh, he would prefer to have this much nicer rayon covered three wire power cord. And look at that, even the plug sort of matches the brown color of the rayon. I mean, this is first class stuff. I have never, never seen or, or heard of these. I know I'll get 900 comments telling me what an idiot I am because they're widely offered uh, at every 7-Eleven store. But uh, now that I know they exist, I will probably start ordering some myself. Well, that's about it for our perusal of this ancient gem. Uh, we'll go into detail on the circuit, the tubes, and its history, if we can find it. Uh, try to uh, get the proper age, the date of uh, construction. And also, I'm going to give you a little hint here and urge you to stay tuned because I have a really exciting announcement to make somewhere around the middle of the video. Okay, so uh, with that in mind, let's get started. 
Well, here we have the really nice looking vintage tube set that came in this amplifier. It's tempting to think that the three Raytheon tubes are original. Um, this is the 6C5. Then we have the 6N6. The 6N7, which is kind of mysterious because there is no tube socket labeled for it. And then the number 80 rectifier. Now since all of these tubes are rather unusual, let's go down the line, starting with the rectifier, and uh, see uh, how these tubes are designed internally and how they function. Okay, let's start off our discussion of the rather unusual tubes that are used in this amplifier. And first off is going to be the number 80 rectifier tube. Now, in the very early days, all tubes uh, were designated with generally with just two numbers. Uh, they were 45s, 30s, things like that. So if you see a tube with two digits as its number, that's an early one. Also look at the base. There's only four pins. Two are large, two are small, so that the tube can only go in one way. They hadn't come up with the idea of that uh, polarizing uh, center post with the little uh, extension on it that would only go in one way. So here we have a number 80 Raytheon uh, rectifier tube. It's a full wave rectifier and while we're looking at this let's talk about the evolution of tube rectifier. Now there are some that came before but the first one that you're likely ever to encounter is going to be the number 80. It's very early. It, it probably came out in the mid to late 20s. Uh, so it was uh, prevalent up through the early 30s. Uh, you see that the uh, plate volts that it can generate, uh, a, a maximum will be 450. Uh, plate current is 125 milliamps, uh, which is kind of modest by today's standards, but it's back then the circuits were smaller as uh, the one in the amplifier that we're studying. Um, the filament current was only 2 amps, as you'll see that's not too bad, and the reservoir cap, that's the first capacitor in the um, power rail that comes out for the B plus to smooth it, is around 20 microfarads. We see that the base has the two small pins and the two large pins. Okay, and uh, one other thing here that's important is how is the cathode heated? Is it directly heated or indirectly heated? Now that might not make much sense right now, but in just a few minutes it will. So here is our number 80 tube. It's just as simple as it can be. Pins 1 and 4 are large diameter, as we saw Right here you see that these are much larger diameter than these. Um, one and four are the filament. Uh, that is also the cathode. Um, I, that's probably a little bit confusing, but in this case it's a coated piece of wire and it acts as a cathode and it is directly heated. In other words, there's not a separate filament and cathode like we're used to seeing in more modern tubes. They simply heat up the cathode. It releases electrons and over here we have the two plates. We see that the plates are connected to the small pins 2 and 3, whereas 1 and 4, the large pins, are connected to the directly heated cathode. Okay, now let's look at a few other rectifier tubes that you might encounter. On some early jukeboxes you'll see five Z3 tubes and uh, also you'll find five U4s. They're electronically almost identical, but as we'll see, if you look out here, the tube base is very different. The 5Z3 has the four pins, too large, too small, just like the 80 did. But the 5U4 is an octal based tube. It has eight pins, which is what we're most uh, more accustomed to. Okay, the uh, plate voltage that you can expect from the 5Z3 or the 5U4, around 450 volts. And look at this, more than double the plate current, it can go up to 275 milliamps. So these are kind of workhorse tubes that are capable of driving a more powerful amp. 
well, you don't get something for nothing. You have to provide filament uh, current that's higher. It's 3 amps, which is a pretty stout demand on a transformer. But your filament current is 3 amps. Your reservoir cap, uh, because of the greater current output and, um, and all that it's capable of, is going to be 40 microfarads, double what it was for the 80. Okay, and it looks internally just like the 80 in that the cathode is directly heated. Now let me pull the paper over here so that we can see a comparison between the 80 and the 5Z3 that are 4 pinned and the 5U4 and 5Y3. They still only use 4 pins but they have 8. Uh, that's why on these uh, like 5U4 or 5Y3 rectifier uh, two base you might see some pins missing and some of them just aren't used at all but in both cases the output comes from one of the directly heated cathode pins uh, pin 4 in the 80 or 5C3 pin 8 in the 5U4 or as we will see in the 5Y3 now those of us with vintage amps are really familiar with the next uh, rectifier and uh, that's the 5Y3 and you're not going to find 5Y3's in 50 or 100 watt amps because the plate voltage output is rather low at only 375 volts theoretically maximum for, uh, for a 5Y3 uh, we're back down to 125 milliamps 2 amp uh, filament current and because of this low plate voltage we can get away with like a 10 or 20 microfarad reservoir cap. It's an octal based tube and just like the 5U4 the cathode is directly heated. Now no list of rectifiers would be complete without the ultimate of them all uh, which is the GZ34 and it's also known as a 5AR4. Uh, it's capable of 600 plate volts. Uh, the plate current is uh, as high as 250 milliamps, not quite as stout as a 5U4 or 5Z3, but still double the 5Y3 or the 80. And look at this, it's a very efficient tube. You get this really high voltage out of it with only a 1.9 amp filament current. Okay, also you can get away with a much higher uh, capacitance reservoir cap uh, for good smoothing. Okay, now uh, it is an octal based tube just like the 5Y3 and the 5U4, but the cathode is indirectly heated. Now let's talk about direct versus indirect heating of the cathode. Now when we talk about the directly heated cathodes, uh, which is, are found in the first four of the rectifiers we've discussed, 80, 5Z3, 5U4, and 5Y3, we see the cathode is directly connected to the 5 volt filament voltage which is provided for the rectifier tube. In both cases, this is the cathode and it is directly heated by that filament voltage. In the GZ34, however, we see that we send our uh, filament voltage in through pins 2 and 8 and it heats up the filament just like in regular tubes like 6L6s and 12AX7s. The filament is heated, not the cathode directly. Instead, the heat from the filament comes up here and heats up the cathode and then causes it to release electrons. Now there is a, a sort of a latent period. Uh, it's just like when you turn on the stove, the water doesn't boil right away. We send in our 5 volts to the uh, pins 2 and 8 and the heat starts to rise and after about 10 or 15 seconds, maybe even more, the cathode starts to release electrons and when they when it does the B plus then because these represent two diodes and because of the way the diodes are biased we get the output here from the cathode down and out from pin 8. If this confuses you how this can happen or work 
please see uh, a video that I posted about a rectification and rectifier tubes in a previous video. I go into greater detail. Okay, but for now, you see that there is this latent period where we start the fire down here in the filament. It takes it a while to heat up the cathode. Emission starts in about 10, 15, 20 seconds. It's sort of like a built-in standby switch. You get a slow startup when you use a GZ34. When you heat the filament uh, or cathode directly, the electrons will start coming off almost immediately. You can plug a, a 5U4 or 5Y3 into an amp, flip it on, and see how long it takes before you will start getting sound out of your uh, amplifier tubes. Plug in a GZ34 after the amp tubes have cooled down and you'll see it takes considerably longer. It's much more gentle on your amplification tubes. Okay, so we get the 1.9 amp low filament current. We get the very high voltage output. We can use a rather high capacitance uh, reservoir cap for good uh, early and, and uh, very efficient smoothing. And we get the slow, gentle startup. That's why I say the GC34 is the best of all rectifier tubes. Next on our cavalcade of weird tubes is the 6C5. Okay, we see two sockets labeled for 65s on the chassis, and we see that it is the simplest of all amplification tubes, a triode. Okay, the plate is connected to pin 3, grid is pin 5, uh, the indirectly heated cathode is connected to pin 8, the filament current is about 300 milliamps, which is fairly typical for a triode preamp tube and the amplification factor is a measly 20. Okay, now we're used to seeing 12AX7s that have a 100 amplification factor, so this one is not a particularly high output tube. Now the next tube that had a labeled socket in our chassis was the uh, 6N6. It's a fairly expensive tube. They're around $37 a piece, whereas the 65 was only like $6 or $7. And it's also a very unusual tube internally. As you can see, it's a duo triode, but it doesn't behave like any duo triode that we've ever seen before. The signal is put into pin 5, which is the grid of the first triode. And the output comes out of the plate, but at the same time, we're going to take the cathode uh, of this first triode and connect it directly to the grid of the second triode. Now remember that the cathode is uh, in phase with the grid. Okay, so both grids then will be in phase. Uh, this one will be driven by the music signal. This one will be driven by the cathode of the first triode. So what we have here amounts to a like a two-cylinder engine. Okay, and both cylinders are operating at the same time. Okay, they're in phase. So what we're going to get then is sort of like a double triode output. We're going to get an output from pin 3 and an output from pin 4. The other thing that's unusual about this tube is that it is internally biased. There is a little resistor built into the tube that provides the uh, cathode bias and the grid bias that we need to make the, uh, the tube function. So it's really uh, sort of like an unusual uh, output tube, more powerful than you would imagine, and it requires no external cathode biasing or bypassing. It's capable of putting out uh, at least 5 watts, maybe 6 or 7 under good conditions, which is a pretty darn good output. Okay, that's more than the Fender Champ would have. And remember this operates in a single-ended circuit, but that's a pretty healthy output then for a single-ended uh, amplification circuit. Now the next amplification tube, the 6N7, does not have a socket labeled on this chassis, but since the tube was included I thought I would discuss it anyway. And we see that it is a duo triode with a shared cathode. Okay, so uh, we've seen tubes like this before. Uh, it's not that unusual. Uh, it's not anything like the 6N6. Okay, uh, you can get 
uh, either two stages of preamplification or you can get one stage for each of two inputs. Okay, one input uh, from your guitar uh, goes to pin four, this grid, and we have uh, preamplification. And we can have a second input to pin five, which is the other grid, the second triode, and get amplification. So um, this tube uh, is much more common and uh, fairly straightforward. We'll see how it works in the circuit, if indeed it does work at all. So just a brief review, we have discussed the evolution of tube rectifiers um, and uh, at one example of one of the more primitive types is the one in this circuit which is the number 80 tube. Okay, And we've compared it with other uh, more common and more modern and generally more efficient rectifier tubes, uh, several of which we're much more familiar with. We talked about the 6C5, the 6N6, and the 6N7 to see uh, how they are constructed, what their function is, and how they can serve us in this circuit. And we discussed the peculiarities of the 6N6 and of how it can function as a parallel duo triode output tube. And now for the momentous announcement that I promised you in the beginning of the video. It finally arrived. YouTube uh, sent us a plaque commemorating uh, our achievement of, of 100,000 subscribers. Once you open the lid, you uh, will see a nice layer of protective foam, which I'll remove, and then a very thoughtful and uh, very nice form letter uh, addressed to us. Uh, I'll let you freeze the screen if you want to read the whole thing, but very nicely stated um, and also uh, they included a business card from someone at the uh, trophy place that made the trophy also uh, offering their congratulations and I should call Rick if there was any problem or damage to the plaque during shipping then after removing the protective plastic wrap we see a really nice heavy and thick brushed aluminum plaque and it says presented to Stratosaurus 47 was my original YouTube uh, name and uh, the channel was named of course Uncle Doug's Vintage Amps for passing 100,000 subscribers from YouTube and um, I know some people scoff at these and think you know how silly and who cares uh, I do I think it's really nice and I really appreciate that YouTube uh, had this prepared and sent to us and I appreciate their nice letter even though I know it's a form letter uh, I'm gonna assume that they meant it more when they sent it to me okay um, but anyway I thought I'd share that with you I hope you uh, will share in our enthusiasm and appreciation uh, for this really nice award uh, you all made it happen so thanks to every one of you. Well, I unplugged the electrodynamic speaker, undid the four screws in the bottom of the cabinet, and here is our chassis. And once I got it out here where I could see it clearly, look at what I found. They have put a rubber stamp above this tube socket saying 6N7. Okay, so uh, apparently that overrides the identification here on the socket and uh, when we flip the chassis over and take a look I have a feeling then that this socket will be wired quite differently from this socket because as you recall the 6N7 was a duo triode not a single triode like the 6C5 and after I turn it over look at this it's like a time capsule from around 1940 or so everything is exactly as it left the factory notice the die they put on each of the solder joints um, I guess then it would show if, if they were tampered with actually it kind of looks like the original cord it might be a new plug on the end though that kind of looks added on um, you know darn well these jewels are going to be uh, way over the hill um, bunch of caps looks like this will actually be an enjoyable job 
Um, I really think that the majority of these capacitors need to be replaced. We can always test them and see, but for right now, I am very pleasantly surprised. Okay, this is like one in a million. It's just flawless. I doubt that this chassis had been out of the cabinet. And then the minute I say that, I see this after production uh, solder mark and look at that for a cold solder joint right there. So yes, chassis has been out of the cabinet. Yes, it's been worked on probably by an inebriated chimp if, if that's the best they could do for a solder joint. So uh, with that in mind then, uh, it's not completely virgin territory but it's not far from it. Then looking down here at that uh, socket that was relabeled with a rubber stamp 6N7 Notice how different the wiring is than the 6C5 socket right next to it. Notice this is an open lug here and it is not open on this. So uh, apparently they upgraded uh, after installing the tube sockets and um, went ahead with a 6N7 here, dual triode, single triode. And the power cord was replaced because we can see that there's no yellow paint on the white or over here on the black wire where it soldered in. So this was uh, put in later. Okay, probably at the same time that this beautiful soldering job right here was done. Okay, first to taste the wrath of our soldering iron uh, will be this big fat 12 microfarad at 470 volt uh, electrolytic. You see that uh, it's grounded here to the chassis and over here it goes to where the B plus is coming out of the rectifier, the number 80. So uh, let's go ahead and wire in a suitable replacement uh, from this uh, tube pin to ground. Well the closest replacement I have is a 16 microfarad Sprague Atom at 475 volts. Uh, so let's go ahead and use this cap. Now people ask me all the time about the leeway and the values of replacement caps. Well you can go up a bit in capacitance. In this case we're at uh, what 33 percent increase which is uh, not going to have any effect uh, to speak of and the voltage rating is exactly the same. So you can go up slightly on the capacitance and you can go up on the uh, voltage rating but you never can go down. Okay, to be honest, probably 450 would work here, but I feel good that I have a 475 instead. So here's our new Sprague Atom installed uh, with very short leads and out of the way. Next, uh, we'll go for this, looks like uh, two capacitors and a single tube. Here's that great big fat electrolytic. It's been liberated from the chassis. It's hard to read the values, but it's eight. Eight. Okay, so each of the red wires uh, connects to eight microfarads of capacitance within the tube and I had to pull a band to see that it's 475 working volts. Okay, so the closest I have to this is going to be 10, 10 at 450. But uh, I'm just going to go with that. I think it'll be just fine. This is not the reservoir cap and uh, I think the 450 will be uh, well within the safe operating limits. And there we see the two new 10, 10 electrolytics connected to the same uh, terminal strip uh, pins that the original red leads from the old cap were connected to. I even used some of the original insulating material just for fun. And we see that it's grounded to the same terminal lead that the original cap black wire went to. Now that we've replaced the electrolytics, let's uh, turn our attention to the nonpolar caps. I'm working without a schematic here. Uh, I doubt that I'd be able to find an accurate one. Um, most of these old Valco amps, um, the schematics were just a, a rather crude approximation. Um, but uh, you just use your common sense. We see here one going from the AC to ground. Obviously this is the death cap which will be removed. And then we look over here uh, going between amplification tubes and uh, there's no doubt that those are uh, coupling caps. Okay, so we're going to replace those also. 
The first old waxy coupling cap I've removed is a 0.05 microfarad at 600 volts and it connected the plate of this tube to the grid right here of this tube um, as all coupling caps do. The way I know that that is the plate even without a tube diagram or a schematic is that the B plus which is coming into this point goes through this plate resistor to that terminal so that's got to be the plate and since it's coming over here to this tube that's got to be a grid. And just to double check um, this is pin 3 of the 6N7 and we see that the 6N7 pin 3 is indeed a plate and the other end of the coupling cap went to this pin which is a pin, uh, pin 4 which is no contact but it, you see it jumpers over here to pin 5 of the 6C5 and sure enough that is the grid. So as you can see you can use your common sense to pretty well uh, decipher the tube socket wiring and what components are going to what pins without a schematic. Here's our new 0.05 microfarad at 630 volt coupling capacitor installed uh, directly to the tube pins not that kind of J-hook type of connection and uh, next we'll replace this cap. And the second waxy coupling cap uh, to be removed is this a 0.1 microfarad at 200 volts and it goes from the plate here of the 6C5 over to the grid here of the 6N6. There's the 0.1 microfarad coupling cap installed. Now let's turn our attention to these two electrolytics. They're 10 microfarads and they're connected to cathodes. This one to the cathode of the 6N7. This one to the cathode of the 6C5. Uh, what's your guess that these might be uh, bypass caps? So let's go ahead and remove them and replace them too while we're at it. All right, the two cathode bypass caps have been replaced. I used 25 microfarad at uh, 50 volts instead of the 10 microfarad at 25 volts uh, that the originals had. Um, I thought these are rather interesting electrolytics. They're called New Process Mighty Midget 911 cap. I guess that's you dial 911 when you use one of them. Um, but anyway, I thought they were pretty cute. Okay, so uh, throw them in the old uh, Cool Whip bowl and I think we've got one last cap to look at and it's this jewel right here. Well amazingly enough after a brief search on the internet I was able to find the schematic for our little Oahu amp and sure enough even the schematic shows the 6N7 as the first tube uh, the dual triodes being used uh, one triode for each of the inputs. Now even though uh, Valco schematics are rarely very accurate, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. Um, we see the 6N7 is indeed the first preamp tube and each of the two triodes is used uh, for preamplification of one of the inputs. Here's uh, one signal input going uh, directly to the grid and out and the second uh, input goes through a volume control and into the grid of the second triode and out. So depending on which of the inputs you plug into, uh, you will or will not have a volume control and you will activate either the left or right triode. Regardless of which input you use, the preamplified signal will pass through this uh, coupling cap here, 0.047 microfarad, into the grid of the 6C5. Now we remember it's just a single triode. This provides a second stage of amplification to either of the first stages. Uh, and then when we come out of the plate here we'll go through another uh, coupling cap, another 0.047 a microfarad. Uh, remember that was the waxy caps that we replaced and we'll come down here into the grid uh, 
the input grid on our mysterious 6 and 6 output tube. Okay, and uh, we see that the two output uh, plates are uh, coupled together so that they're operating in tandem or in parallel and coming out here to drive the primary winding of our uh, single-ended output transformer. We see the schematic shows one, two, three, four electrolytic capacitors, whereas um, our circuit only has three. We see that it shows the field coil of the electrodynamic uh, speaker right here being used as a filter choke. Um, the filament wiring is fairly routine and we see here that they show a 5Y3 rectifier but we know that our circuits using the 80. I believe our circuit is earlier than the one that's depicted here. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that this schematic came from the pre-war amp project. Uh, now this is a site on the internet that specializes in schematics and uh, investigation into these very early rather primitive amp circuits which I personally dearly love and I'm sure a bunch of you do too. If you remember my mystery amp uh, video series a lot of the information and the schematics came from this site so I recommend the pre-war amp project to any of you who have an interest in the history of uh, audio amplification. It also has something that's not on the schematic and that is a 0.001 microfarad capacitor from uh, one of the plates of the 6N6 to ground and all I can think of is uh, perhaps that's to eliminate um, radio frequencies or something like that or cut down on oscillation. Um, I'm going to replace it too just to be sure that uh, there's no leakage or any type of internal shorts. Now it's time to install our really nice rayon covered uh, three-wire power cord to the chassis. I've already removed the original power cord that's passed through this grommet. Here we see the new three-wire power cord is installed. The green ground wire is soldered to the same point on the filter choke as that 0.001 microfarad capacitor. The black wire comes directly over here to the on-off switch which piggybacks on the volume control. Comes over to the distal end of the uh, fuse holder. Comes out of the upper portion of the fuse holder and goes over to the uh, primary winding of the power transformer. The white return wire just goes to the other primary uh, terminal of the uh, power transformer. The old grommet was a walled out mess so I replaced it with a brand new one and then I found that uh, it was just too snug for the introduction of the power cord uh, so I had to take it out to dinner and buy it flowers but finally we were able to penetrate the chassis and connect our wires. You know something I just noticed while I was getting ready to test uh, the circuit um, the whole interior of the cabinet has been nicely wallpapered with kind of a brown leather pebble grain paper and then right down here in the corner there's a little sticker that says made in USA which is rather quaint. Okay so let's uh, set this jewel up on the workbench, connect it to the chassis and see if our amp works. Well we're all set up here, chassis on the workbench, I've installed that really nice set of vintage tubes um, I plugged in the electrodynamic uh, original speaker. I'm injecting a 300 cycle per second tone into input number one and the amp is plugged in to the current limiter. Let's turn on the power, see what happens. Well first off I'm pleased to see that the pilot light's working the current limiter bulb is not glowing and we're getting a really nice clean 300 cycle per second tone pretty good volume turn it down 
I'm hearing a tiny bit of hum. Uh, let's see if it's 120 cycle or 60 cycle. So I've set the uh, audio signal generator at 120 cycles per second and I'm going to inject that into the amp. If it's the exact same frequency as the amp itself is generating, we'll be able to tell because the frequencies will coincide. Uh, they might even oscillate uh, and sort of interfere with each other. Um, so uh, let's turn up the volume and see what it sounds like. Yes, kind of an interference pattern. No doubt that the frequency of the hum is 120 cycles per second, which indicates uh, incomplete filtration. And I'm thinking that I might want to go back into the circuit and add the fourth electrolytic capacitor. This one was missing in our circuit. It's on the schematic, and it sounds to me like it might be necessary. Well, the rewiring job is finished, and I must tell you, that for a relatively simple circuit, this thing has had me pulling what's left of my hair out. Okay, first off, uh, it differs greatly from the schematic, uh, which is very typical of Valco circuits. People uh, will contact me and say, oh my god, I have to find a Valco schematic for my Oahu amp. And um, as I tell them, you're almost better off without one, because I have never seen a Valco a circuit that matched the schematic that was supposed to describe it. Okay, there's all sorts of differences. It's like on a day-to-day -day basis they changed things and they never altered the schematic. So, you know, get your schematic if you want, but in this case I found it better to ignore the schematic and just go ahead and fix the circuit before me. Uh, one of the things though that the schematic did show me is that they used four electrolytic uh, filter caps, one, two, three, four, and the circuit we had here only had three. So I added an extra node. Okay, I did 200K over to this point, put in a new 10 microfarad cap, brought it back with 220K here to the plate of the uh, 6N7. So now I have four uh, electrolytic uh, filter cap nodes with resistors in between. That did quiet down the 120 hertz hum, but once that hum was eliminated, something else came up to make life miserable. Okay, we'll discuss that in just a minute. One other oddity about this circuit that I've never seen before is that it has a field coil speaker, and the field coil is used as a filter choke. But this circuit has a second filter choke. Okay, and you, you got to admit that's a little redundant on a on a small circuit like this. And uh, then it really didn't help that much because you heard the 120 cycle hum. So now that is eliminated, as I said. But all sorts of oddities here and and uh, differences. Uh, at the uh, many of the resistor values were way off. Let me show you how bad. Now these early resistors have to be read a little differently. It looks like there's three color bands there, but um, actually you read them body, and and dot, like BED. I've shown you that on the very early types. Uh, in this case, the dot has sort of mutated into a band around the center. Okay, so if we read the body that's brown, that's 10, 0, times 10,000, so this is a 100K resistor, and it's, what, 73% high? Okay, uh, way out of spec. Uh, some of the others are, are worse. They're like two and a half times higher than they should be. So, uh, I think with that in mind, uh, I went ahead and replaced a bunch of resistors. Uh, the ones that I left checked out uh, within uh, normal specs. Uh, also, I checked the plate dissipation of the output tube um, and I found that the voltage drop across the 449 ohm uh, output transformer primary winding was a negative 15.3 volts. 
which uh, gives 34 milliamps uh, with a play voltage of only 277 volts we end up with 9.44 watts of plate dissipation which is acceptable for the uh, 6N6 output tube. Okay, so it uh, looks like we're in good shape. Uh, let's go ahead then and um, flip it over and discuss what other problems arose. Welcome to the sweepstakes winner in what else can go wrong. After the 120 hertz hum was eliminated by the addition of that extra node in the power supply, now the amp has developed a very stout 60 cycle hum. And by a little bit of tapping around I find that the 6N7 is extremely microphonic. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking capable of some sort of like acoustic feedback uh, being near the speaker. So let's replace it with a brand new 6N7 and see if that helps. Okay, here's a brand new Kenrad uh, 6N7 tube, metal bodied, and still has some microphonic properties, but the 60 cycle hum essentially went away. All I hear now is a little bit of a power hum. So, it's still slightly microphonic, but apparently this tube, the original 6N7, had some sort of internal problems in which uh, 60 cycles from the filament was being picked up, probably by the cathode. Okay, so this tube's junk, and uh, we have a new tube in its place. One great surprise I had uh, while checking out the two inputs is that when you plug into input number two, which is actually at, on the top here in the schematic, there is no volume control. The volume control is only for the left-hand input. So uh, anything you plug in over here, it's as if the amp is turned up to absolute full volume. So you're going to have to use your instrument volume control to uh, control the loudness when you plug into the second input and you have this volume control if you plug into the first uh, input okay and and boy is it a surprise if you don't know that one other consideration when looking at the schematic is the absence of any grid leak resistor uh, on the input that has no volume control um, now that's really not that big of an issue because uh, the uh, instrument volume control serves as a variable grid leak resistor and let's see how our music signals coming out of the pickup goes to the volume control pot on the guitar and varying amounts of that signal is sent to ground the ground is continuous through the shield of the instrument cable that plugs into the amp and that shield connects the ground of that potentiometer in the instrument to the chassis of the amp. So this then is a variable grid leak resistor. But just for conformity's sake, I'm going to go ahead and add a 1 meg grid leak resistor to this wire. With that said, let's button this jewel up and uh, play some tunes through it and see how it sounds.
Well, that about does it for this video extravaganza on the mighty pre-war Oahu amplifier. As usual, I want to thank my PayPal contributors and Patreon patrons for their generosity in keeping our channel on the air for another month. Should you like to join them, I'll put links in the video description uh, which will assist you to do so. I also want to thank YouTube for recognizing our 100,000 subscribers and also uh, recognize those 100,000 subscribers because without you all there would be no Uncle Doug uh, video channel. So thanks to everyone. Uh, I hope you share in our joy over the receipt of this nice plaque and we'll stay tuned for future videos. Thanks so much.